So uh, I'm Piotr Balzer. I'm one of the developers behind PMDK. And today I'm going to be uh, talking about how uh, we changed PMDK as we learned more and more about persistent memory. So this talk is going to be hardcore programming, just, uh, just so you know. Um, <clears throat> So before, but before we begin, I want to uh, first briefly introduce what even is P PMDK. So PMDK stands for Persistent Memory Development Kit, and it's a suite of libraries uh, and tools designed to make persistent memory programming easier. And we really think of it as the standard library for uh, persistent memory. So we are, like you have your libc, where you have malloc and free and stuff like that. Uh, persistent PMDK um, kind of tries to provide you with similar types of capabilities uh, for your applications. So we have two different types of libraries. We have persistent uh, libraries and then we have volatile libraries. Uh, the volatile libraries are mostly for um, taking advantage of the high capacities of obtaining persistent memory. Uh, so um, the, the few libraries that we have is LibVM cache, which is what Soji mentioned in his presentation. It's an LRU cache. And then we have a couple of um, allocators that are derived from jmalloc. And those allocators allocate memory from PMEM instead of DRAM, which is not an, as easy as it sounds to change. Um, so then the, there are the more interesting uh, libraries, the persistent ones. and in here, we have a couple of different things for different people. Uh, so at the, at the bottom, we have libpm and librpm. libpm is um, the very bare bones of what you really need for writing software for persistent memory. Uh, it, it has stuff like mapping your files, uh, pr giving you information about whether or not you have actual persistent memory. It also ships with optimized memcopy and memset for persistent memory. And then we have librpmem, which is kind of our example implementation of how to use RDMA in combination with PMEM, with persistent memory. Moving up, uh, we have libpmmj, which is our flagship library. It implements um, memory allocation and transactions for persistent memory. Then we have libpmmj cpp, which is built on top of that, and it just provides you a way nicer interface uh, for those use cases because it's in C++ instead of C. And then we have libpmkv, which is built again on top of libpmj C++ that provides you even easier interface. So first I'm going to be talk talking about usability uh, um, changes that we've made over the years. So, our, so I'm, right now I'm going to be focused on libpmj mostly. Uh, so our first draft of the LPMJ API implementation was um, what you see. It's not very pretty, and it's uh, really hardcore C that uh, probably not many people will even understand at, at the first glance. Um, so the reason why this looks like it does is because um, this, is our, this was our first draft, and two, we really wanted to use C without any compiler modifications. So we didn't want to uh, introduce any preprocessing steps uh, into the compilation so that we just use what C, uh, uh, C99 gave us. So the result is uh, kind of difficult to, to use API. But nevertheless, uh, we haven't given up and we made some optimizations. So about two years later, uh, we came up with an API that used a tons, tons of macros uh, to make this a little bit simpler to use. Uh, so compared to the previous slide, um, right now we have um, typed pointers, because previously, uh, if you wanted to use persistent memory, you kind of gave up types uh, in our previous API. And with this API, we actually retain the type information. Uh, we also simplify the transaction flow. So this is what our API looks like right now, and all of the future LPMJ libraries look like this. So we think this is a good uh, middle step between uh, having um, very difficult to use but powerful library and um, something that's very limited but convenient to use. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I think that this is uh, what we, what 
this is what um, we could have came up with for C. Uh, I don't, um, I don't really see a way for for making this a little bit simpler in C without any compiler compiler changes. Um, so instead of uh, instead of focusing on C, we really wanted to move a little bit forward, and then we uh, spent a little bit uh, of time thinking um, how we the APIs could look like if we were to have a more expressive language than C. So we turned to C++ and then we made a couple of prototypes to see uh, what we can achieve with, um, with the meta, uh, meta programming uh, capabilities of that language. And the result is uh, pretty nice, um, uh, if, I, if, if I can say so myself. Um, so instead of having the bulk of the changes um, concentrated on the code, we instead shifted the focus to the type system. So uh, whereas previously, um, so for example here, um, we have a ma macros that are used to the reference um, the reference objects, pointers, uh, which is clunky to use and you pretty much have to modify your, every single line of your application if you had an existing application uh, to use this. Uh, with LPMJ C++, we uh, made it simpler so that um, the, really the, all of the uh, changes are mostly concentrated in the type system so you ch instrument your types with, instead of using a shared pointers, you use persistent pointers and stuff like that. And then you just wrap things in a transaction and that makes it automatically tran uh, transactional. So this was our evolution and what we think is um, kind of the ideal way of uh, writing software for personal more from uh, in, in PMDK right now because it allows you to have all of the features of the PMJ without being constrained by C. Um, so one of the things that uh, we learned in this experience was uh, we released way, way too early. So look at the dates on those slides. So it, this was um, literally four or five years ago. And uh, the one point zero release was created like three years prior to any hardware being available. So this led to us not being really that experienced with um, the actual persistent memory hardware. So uh, we also could have used more time with the designing of the APIs. Um, so uh, other thing is that metaprogramming and types and using the type system instead of relying on the um, arcane C macros is a, um, really a great way to uh, simplify coding. So some people might say that using C++ and templates and stuff like that is uh, error prone, uh, but I think that um, it really simplified um, what we wanted to accomplish. But um, nevertheless, we didn't uh, think that um, Leaping of JC++ is for everyone because uh, it still required quite a lot of uh, knowledge about um, writing uh, C++ and persistent memory and transactions and, and allocations and data structures. So we made a step um, even for, uh, further and um, we created a simple key value store API uh, that can be used by anyone and is just way, way simpler than any other or, or approaches. Um, so we did this because um, people are familiar with key values or APIs. And uh, before introducing the key values or API, we had very um, limited, limited interest in uh, LPMJ, LPMJ C++, because those libraries are really, well, difficult to use. So providing an intermediate step that people can just take and experiment with really helps. So um, 
An another thing that I, I feel we kind of rushed uh, initially is um, the interface for memo memory allocation. So we just simply took the memory allocation interface that you, you have with DRAM, so malloc, and we created a persistent version of malloc. Kind of. In a transaction, it works like this. So um, like on this slide, we, we have a make shared. So this is what you will do in volatile memory to create a shared object. And on persistent memory, we created something called make persistent, which allows you to allocate persistent memory. Uh, so this made perfect sense to us because people are familiar with memory allocation interfaces that they used. But one uh, unfortunate aspect of the dynamic manual memory um, management is fragmentation. Um, and with persistent memory, the length of life of the heap is way, way longer than for volatile applications because the heap can live on for years. Um, and the heap outlives the application process. So um, we have to think a little bit more um, about fragmentation. And in hindsight, I think forcing people, forcing the application to uh, design the uh, core data structures around trying to solve fragmentation uh, will be a re real benefit. So for example, you can um, work around fragmentation by using um, by using slab allocators. So creating an API that will instead um, force you to use slab allocators for, for your objects will be uh, beneficial. Uh, so to, um, we actually introduced a kind of similar API to LPMOJ C++, but it's, it's not a core API. You don't have to use it. And uh, the, everything just still works uh, with make persistent, just normal malloc. But um, um, just using the slab allocator will be just better. Um, <clears throat> so one of our uh, biggest goals with PMDK is correctness. And uh, we want to make sure that um, everything we ship and we release is as correct as we can make it. And, but what I mean by that is that if you crash your application at any moment on time, uh, then we want to make sure that that uh, region of memory is recoverable and you can get back to your data, to your allocated objects, for example. Um, so doing that, making sure that everything is correct, um, is really not simple. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time in, in to to develop tools like PM check and PM order uh, that allows us, allow us to um, identify potential mistakes and bugs in code and then fix them before we ship anything and before we, ha we have any bugs in uh, production. But um, so the problem with uh, the approaches that we have is um, Checking if um, a complicated data structure modification is correct, is fail safe consistent, is very expensive because you have to effectively step through every single step of your application memory state and then check if that memory state is consistent. Um, so instead, we, we, are, we are trying to, we effectively did isolate uh, certain parts of our algorithms uh, so that we just check smaller bits of um, algorithms and then uh, we bundle them together to make uh, to, to make sure that everything is uh, everything together is correct also <clears throat> so now I'm gonna shift focus to performance and how we changed performance over time and why <clears throat> So this is a chart showing you um, the difference on, of performance between the version of LPMJ. So we started um, really bad, I think, <laughs> honestly. So we improved, uh, improved performance over five times uh, over the course of a couple of years. So current version of LPMJ is 1.7. So it's 5.5 times um, better now. And 
uh, one of the things that we um, really uh, started thinking about uh, when designing the algorithms in, um, with, for the new versions of the PMJ is that persistent memory isn't really just memory, like we thought about before. It really has characteristics of both storage and memory. And we really should think about how this algorithm will uh, perform even on traditional storage. So uh, this is an example of um, how we changed our transactional subsystem to make it perform better on persistent memory when treated as storage. So uh, whereas previously, we, uh, for transactions, we um, created allocations for every single snapshot, for example. Uh, right now, we simply create a buffer where we create snapshots for transactions. So that larger buffer allows us to um, simplify the snapshotting logic instead of creating small allocations for every single, uh, every single one. Um, so, what I really want to uh, highlight here is that um, the performance of non persistent memory can be really tricky to get right. And we had to um, focus really hard on even individual cache misses that we encountered during development. Um, so um, another point I really want to make sure uh, that sticks is that um, persistent memory is really disrupting. And I, like I said, it has characteristics of both storage and memory. And uh, this means that things like cache oblivious data structures or data structures designed for persistent memory like LSM trees can be really beneficial when designed right for PMEM. Okay, so um, one other thing that we uh, did for in lib PMEM uh, was creating our own implementation of mem copy. And we didn't d d do this for performance reasons really, or maybe not for throughput reasons, uh, but rather for um, to make sure that our uh, mem copy is deterministic with, in terms of what instruction does it use. Because um, certain types of instructions have different um, influence on the whole system. Uh, so for example, one of the flags that you can pass to our implementation of mem copy is uh, non-temporal. If you pass that non-temporal flag to memcopy, then uh, you are guaranteed that the memcopy will use uh, non-temporal instructions. And what this gives you is um, the possibility of, of, of avoiding cache flashing uh, because the non-temporal instructions bypassed the CPU cache. Uh, so what we learned uh, when we've been working on PNDK and its data structures is that using, correctly using non-temporal uh, stores is very critical for performance. And avoiding cache flashing and necessary expenses when possible is the way to go. Um, okay, so once again about memory allocator. Um, so <laughs> after transactions, our memory allocator is the most changed thing in PMDK. And um, the, initial, the initial interface that we designed it with was kind of similar to malloc, where you provided it with a size and then it give you, gave you allocated object. Uh, but that came with a problem that your allocation had to be immediate. So once the uh, object was allocated, it had to be persistent, and it had to be stored somewhere so that it's, it was reachable. So um, that cost out of performance. So we redesigned this a little bit so that um, the performance, the uh, persistent doesn't have to be immediate. So we changed the interface into two parts where we, you first reserve an object in volatile state and then you publish uh, that object in persistent state. So we first um, make changes in volatile state and then in, then in persistent. This allowed us to do some um, very uh, clever optimizations in various parts of PMDK. Um, so the lesson here is that um, combining DRAM and PMEM uh, 
in algorithms is very beneficial very often uh, because in DRAM you can stage a lot of changes, buffer changes, and then um, on PMEM when you uh, when you, once you gathered the DRAM changes, you can just publish those changes into PMEM uh, without much, much of a problem. Um, one of the other things is that um, offloading data um, to PMEM is um, beneficial when you don't uh, want to delay the main thread of your application because um, when you store something to PMEM, you have to issue an s fence which stalls your CPU, so that's also not um, a very good idea. Uh, so, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, also something worth reiterating is that um, storage-focused algorithms, data structures, are also something that should be um, considered when designing data structures for persistent memory. Um, so this is something that we learned in PMDK and we definitely take advantage of. Okay, that, that was my last slide, thanks. Questions? Thank you. Um, on, your, uh, on the linked list example, the good version, the, the one that you like, my understanding is there's a lock. There's a lock associated with the uh, with yep. the operation there. It's my understanding that locks are released at the very end in some sense. So if a transaction has nested transactions and you're accumulating locks, mm -hmm. they're all released at the end. Is that correct? Yes. How would you implement a highly concurrent linked list, for instance, governed by hand over hand locking? <sighs> Not using this API. <laughs> <laughs> So highly concurrent. Do you have a do you have an API that would be appropriate for that use case? No. It's so that, that's one of the most primordial concurrency paradigms, right? Hand over hand locking. <laughs> well, yeah, but uh, the difficulty with persistent memory concurrency is that is the difference between visibility and um, durability, persistence. So um, making making sure that um, something is durable or persistent and once it's visible as difficult and you have to for example flash after you read something and stuff like that uh, and it's just making concurrent um, concurrent um, linked list for example will be just difficult because you will have to expose a co concurrent, a concurrent swap um, and that type of instructions that also contain persists. And then we will have to have something that reads data that is also making sure that it only reads data that is also persistent. If, uh, it's, a, if it's a tricky problem, there are some grad students here who might take this on as a dissertation project, right? I mean, if, it's, if you don't see light at the end of the tunnel, maybe one of them will. So um, we, what we actually intend on doing and what we are doing right now is we, we ourselves are designing data structures that are concurrent. So we have, um, right now we have a concurrent and ordered map. We have a um, concurrent ordered map that we implement ourselves and that we verify is correct because we believe that n not many people will get it right. So I, I'm not sure if um, making, making an API that is specific for concurrency that is going to be extremely difficult to use is just worth doing. I know that there is, um, a research uh, paper from Microsoft, I don't know, I think so, that is multi-word persistent CAS, something like that. It's clever, but it's not as generic as I would ha want it to have to be a public API of the PMJ. All right.